you very much for the invitation to this prestigious event. It's really humbling to join this event. 50,000 years ago, we didn't have agriculture. 1,500 years ago, we didn't have machines. 15 decades ago, we didn't have combustion engines. And 15 years ago, we didn't have smartphones. The pace of technological change is accelerating, meaning that we all need to be prepared to take advantage of technological advance. Some technologies are taking longer that have an impact. For example, four decades ago, we all were immersed into this new world called the internet. And by that, we actually get access to a new world. Because if 40 years ago, I wanted to connect as a student with a professor at a very famous university across the world, it would have been impossible for me to find this professor's phone number or even to get the attention of his team to reply a question. Today, and even 40 years ago, finally we got this invention of the email. Initially, very funny characters. Now, of course, your first name, last name, and the domain, the institution you are working for. And they were able to connect with our professor. We were able to have a conversation. That was facilitated thanks to the introduction to the browser, a way for us now to easily access to the information that universities, institutions were already sharing among initially researchers. But now it became mainstream. This technology changed our view of the internet. Equally, in 2003, Facebook, now called Meta, became a very international network with billions of people around the world using a number of different products. Steve Jobs and the company he founded, Apple, released a number of devices that made access to the internet even easier, not only for young generations, but also grandma, who now were able to access my pictures on social media and to send me emails, for example. Six years ago, TikTok took the world by storm. So initially, in China, eventually became TikTok, a phenomenon around the world, with millions of creators and consumers accessing the application every day. Of course, the technology is moving in faster. So you can see that the time frames are getting comprised because that's the beauty of these things. We live in a world where we cannot stop watching these headlines about generative AI, AIGC. Last year, November 30th, probably many of you, including myself, were watching a soccer match, Argentina versus Poland. They were competing to go to the next round in the World Cup. Guess what? Other people were already expecting OpenAI's release of ChatGPT. And it was such the impact of these two that in only five days, one million people were already experimenting with this technology. So again, we see an example of how these time frames get compressed very quickly. And there is a reason for that. We've seen already some applications of the potential of this technology. Language, at the end of the day, is our way to communicate. Babies, when they are born, they need to communicate. First crying, first gestures, and then eventually they become able to speak with parents and members of the society. This is being transformed. AI has been used for decades already to help us predict classification problems, regression problems, and so on. But now, the evolution of AI now allows us to have a creative form. Something that can help us, a second brain that can help us to create a poem, create songs, 
perhaps even this speech. Later on, images, videos, protein structures, designs of buildings. So the limits are really in the sky in terms of the things that AI can help us create. So generally, AI indeed will have a big potential in transforming in the same way that AI has been creating this impact in the last decade. To get there, we had some prerequisites to enjoy first. And we talked already about power. We need computing power. Many of the algorithms that we're using today were invented decades ago. Yet, researchers were not able to know how effective they are until they had access to computing infrastructure. Today, widely available thanks to the cloud. Algorithms were also important from CNNs, RNNs to today's transformer architecture. There has been an evolution there, and that has given access to new opportunities. Equally, data. Today, if you want to test a new algorithm, you are able to get access to billions of images, videos, texts, and that's amazing because that allows you to test the effectiveness of your algorithm in very, very quick fashion. And then finally, ecosystem. In the same way that we need to have all these different elements, we also need to have an environment of developers, entrepreneurs, who are going to be using these technologies to provide feedback to developers. They were glad to enjoy a number of models that are available for us to use. And these models now allow us to talk Many of these companies are investing a lot of money in developing large language models. Models that allow us to understand language. And of course, when you think about understanding language, for us, for humans, it's very easy. However, for computers, it's not that easy. Because we need to manage, in any language, 40, 50,000 characters or words. That's something that needs to be translated into a language that computers can understand. And computers, as you know, ultimately rely on chips, semiconductors, that can only understand zeros and ones. So the thousands of characters, the thousands of words in a language need to be translated into a way, into a shape that computers can understand. And that's what these LLMs give us the capability. We need to recognize that man, woman, king, queen, boy, girl, are words that have the same relationship. We need to understand that green, white, yellow are colors, so potentially can be replaced in a stain. So that's what LLMs allow us. These autocomplete features that we enjoy in our smartphones on steroids. That's what LLMs are about today. And of course, the architecture that launched this was the Transformers architecture developed six, seven years ago by Google. Today, thanks to the availability of this technology as an open source offering, everybody in the world can leverage this. Not only that, at this very moment, if you go to Alibaba's small scope platform, you are able to get at least two open source systems pre-developed, evidence that you can use to create your own applications. So Jing Wenjiang from Alibaba, we also have Lama 2 from Meta. These models are incredibly powerful and give you the option to create your own applications, royalty free, meaning that you don't have to pay Meta or Alibaba for the right to use these models up to a certain limit. In the case of Meta, you can create applications that can get up to 700 million users and you don't have to pay a cent to Meta. In the case of Alibaba, up to 100 million users. Meaning that now you don't have to create these models from scratch. These models allow you to create applications to be built on top of it. If you want to cater to the financial services industry, you can create a model. Rely on this based work. If you are developing a customer service application, you want to make sure that the expertise demonstrated to clients is the same coming from a new employee or from the most experienced employee. 
How you guarantee that both types of employees provide the same quality of experience to the final client by giving them access to a world that is online, capturing all the information that the company has. In the same that we think about language, now we also think about images. And these models, because of the power they have, they are able to pretty much come up with all potential images in the world. If you think about two fruits, apple and banana. The apple is long, the banana is long. So that would be one dimension to classify these two fruits. Color can be another dimension. The banana will yellow, apple red. Shininess could be another dimension. An apple is shiny. A banana, not so much. Already there, you have three dimensions. Imagine how many dimensions you need to capture all available pictures, images in the world. Hundreds. And we, humans, don't even need to know what are the features, which are these dimensions. That's what these large models allow us, pretty much to organize a multidimensional space that will capture all images. So any point in this space will potentially represent a high resolution image that we can get to thanks to prompts. So you know already many of these tools available to generate image. And many of them, of course, are free up to a certain level, so you can use them, and I use them myself to generate these slides or my presentation. Developers around the world are already using these models to create new applications that they know better. Whether we're going to be catering to financial services, to manufacturing, to creativity, to marketing, for example, these models will allow us to get applications closer to the user, allowing it the power to use these models in the real context. And that's a development that we're going to see increasing in the future. So this innovation will accelerate. We'll see more and more application deployments of this technology across all industry. In the same way that today we all use AI, and nobody can tell me that they are not using AI, because all of us use a smartphone. And your smartphone has many applications that are leveraging AI. Not only that, in order for you to maintain battery from dying in the day, your smartphone is using AI to save battery. So the application is already out there. And that's what we're going to see in even further fashions using AIGC. There are challenges, indeed. Hallucinations. If you ask a question to any of these models, and none of these models is free from these hallucination cases, you can try to ask questions to the model, and the model is sometimes making big mistakes, assuming that the question, the prompt, is 100% true. Coming up with facts made up, and that is something that we need to be aware of. Not only that, when you think about AIGC, when you think about new technologies, we want to make sure that we are facing problems the whole world knows. For example, in the last centuries, we have seen the deployment of many technologies, and the benefits of these technologies not always went to the general population. Perhaps some of the benefits were only concentrated on the companies developing these technologies. That's what we need to make sure that we're going to avoid using AIGC and the effort to go in that direction is coming even from the United Nations that is trying to create collaboration across nations to make sure that these developments benefit humanity as a whole. So cooperation becomes a must, because these challenges, by default, are global. Poverty is an issue for 2 billion people around the world, and that impacts all of us. Collaboration works positively for companies around the world. Governments and companies, for example, get together in this institution, the International Telecommunication Union, an institution that allows us today to make a phone call, to send an email. Standards were set up by collaboration from governments and companies. And that is something also that we can think of when you look at the future, when you look at, about AI. Because AI is today a very international field. 
If you think about conferences in the field of artificial intelligence, we see collaboration across authors that come from different geographies. And if you look at the studies that are presented at these conferences, there is actually evidence that the studies, the papers that are the most popular, come from authors from different geographies. So it's just evidence that collaboration leads us to better results, to more insightful papers. And that is beneficial to all of us. Talent is everywhere. Yet, opportunity is not equally available. So we can find talent in any geography in the world. Talent is there. It just needs to be found. And this talent goes where the opportunities are. And what are these opportunities? Access to more talent. Access to resources. Access to computing power. To data. That's why you see here a bigger diversity in terms of the origin of top AI researchers who basically are attracted to certain magnets of talent around the world. So if you want to attract talent around the world, make sure to look at the whole world. Because that talent is not only in Europe or America or Asia. Talent is also in Africa. Talent is also in the Middle East. And those are markets that are growing at this very moment. One example was the implementation of the Microsoft Asia Research Lab a few years ago. This was an effort from Microsoft to be a hub of research in Asia, to serve not only Asia, but also the whole world. And the impact of this effort has been very impressive. Today, many of senior executives working at the top companies, for example, in China, they have since at this lab. Many of the founders of the startup companies in China also had states in this lab. So these type of multinational efforts lead to the development of the industry across the world. So when we talk about an international field like AI, we need to think about international cooperation because it is a must. Thank you very much for your attention.